invite you to take your Bibles out and turn with me over to Psalm 69. We're going to be in the book of Psalms tonight, Psalm 69. And we'll be looking at verse 30 to begin with. I might start a fight here, but that's okay. I taught Revelation this last quarter and I said plenty that people would take issue with, but that, eh, what can you do? Um, for levity's sake, if you were to pick the best holiday meal there is, Thanksgiving or Christmas supper, um, many people like to choose Thanksgiving. I choose the latter, but that's beside the point. If you've done any research into the American holiday of Thanksgiving, it's, it's actually quite interesting. It wasn't a national holiday until some point during the Lincoln administration, and then it fell out of favor, and it was FDR who actually fixed it on the fourth Thursday of November. But before that, or neither Washington and several other presidents, there would be periodic years that we would have a Thanksgiving. It wasn't a routine holiday. And the very first Thanksgiving was during, I believe, Washington's first uh, term in office that the nation had gone through a pretty difficult season. Uh, we were still very much an agrarian society at that point. It was a hard winter. It was a hard growing season. And they had, we had made it through as a nation. And so we have that Thanksgiving proclamation that Washington declared that not a day of feasting, but a national day of thanks should be established so that the country could get on its knees and thank God for his provision over the last year. And presidents since Washington have, had done that after a particular trying period, after, uh, uh, after a period of, of trial or tribulation, thanksgivings would pop up in this country. And I'm not trying to preach a, a biblical lesson on the American holiday of Thanksgiving, but I'm illustrating the point that Thanksgiving is an incredibly biblical concept that... I would say many modern Christians in this country, we, we've kind of lost practice of, and I'll raise both my hands on that. If you look at the book of Psalms, as we said, where we're going to be starting off tonight, Psalm 69, verse 30, the psalmist writes here in the midst of this psalm, it says, I will praise the name of God with song and magnify him with thanksgiving. And if we go over to our New Testaments, we'll see that man has a very, very great need for giving of thanks. If you want to turn over to Romans chapter 1. I've said this before in classes and other contexts. But if you look at Romans 1, 18 through 23, and what is commonly being called the, the descent of man into moral depravity, I want us to note a few things here. I'll be reading from the Legacy Standard Version of your Bibles, and it reads as follows. Verse 18 of Romans 1, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, both his eternal power and divine nature, has been clearly seen, being understood though what ha through what has been made. So they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give thanks. But they came futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the likeness of corruptible man and of birds, and of four-footed animals, and growing creatures. Back in verse 21, For even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give thanks. I heard it preached one time, I believe it's a true statement, the, the, the chief sin of believer and non-believer is the fact that we do not honor God as God nor give him thanks. As we look at the both Old and New Testaments, there is this repeated theme over and over and over again of crediting God, if you will, for what he has done for us. And it's interesting because 
modern man, we'd like to think we're so advanced, but really we're not. We're, quote, discovering the things that God has been telling us for some thousands of years now, that gratitude actually is healing to the body, it rewires your brain, and it has nothing but good effects in your life. And that really one of the first steps you need to take if you want to start being more joyful and happier in life is to actually start taking stock of all the things that are going right and all the things that you have that you can be grateful for. So I figure with Thanksgiving this week, it would be a good time to talk about this biblical concept of giving of thanks. Because, you know, if we, if we go over to 1 Thessalonians, for example, and we'll, we'll start looking at some other passages here. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8, Eighteen, excuse me, First Thessalonians five, eighteen, and these short little uh, admonitions Paul gives: sixteen, rejoice always; seventeen, pray without ceasing; eighteen, in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will in, for you in Christ Jesus. You know, it's interesting. People talk about what is God's will. There's only a few times in the Bible that actually it says this is God's will. Two of those times actually occurs in 1 Thessalonians. One is in chapter 4, that God's will for you is your sanctification. He goes on to find that. Another one is right here. This is God's will for you that in everything you would to give thanks. Now, have you thought about that? It's not optional. It's an admonition of the Lord. Just as the same thing as rejoice always, pray without ceasing, verse 9. Do not quench the spirit, verse 20. Do not despise prophecies, verse 21. Examine all things, lay hold, lay, hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. I've been challenged as I've been restudying this and looking at this by, by these admonitions because we, I, I don't give thanks in everything. In fact... Um, I think I've said this before, I'm a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist. That's just how I'm wired. I, I, and you tend to find the negative and what to complain about, right? Easier than what it is to give thanks. And I think there's a reason why God has to tell us these things, because it doesn't come naturally. And the things that are good for us and the things that don't come naturally are the things we need to work on. But how do you give thanks in all things? Now, we're going to talk more about the practicalities of how to, the how of thanksgiving, but, you know, just right here to whet the appetite, but even on, say, your worst days, and some of the, and, and no two worst days are comparable to another person's. Everyone has their own trials and hurts they go through. But even on the worst of days in your life, there are still things that you can at least give God credit for. Now, it's funny. Had a moment earlier this week, and we all have them. I was starting to look at the carpet. My cat has gotten parts of the carpet confused for a litter box, and I'm working on it. Anyway, I'm looking at my carpet, and I'm I know I've cleaned it. I bought a carpet cleaner. I have cleaned that thing as deep as that carpet cleaner can go. You want recommendations on carpet cleaners or sprays or disinfectants? I'm your guy. I have like all of them. I'm underscoring this point. But all I can see is there, 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 bunching up over there. And I start getting real negative about it. I start getting negative the fact that I don't like the carpets matting on the stairs where everybody walks all the time. Or how there's that one tile in the kitchen that the, the tilers didn't do the grout just right. And you can start complaining. What does give thanks in all situations look like? I'm forgetting the fact that I actually own a home. That everything in that house I could only have prayed for several years ago. Never what I thought would... I'd actually go out and buy new furniture and not just pick and you know take whatever I could get as it was in college, right? Even on the worst days, if you're still alive and breathing, that's something more that's something to be thankful about. 
It doesn't diminish the hurt, doesn't diminish the trial you're going through, but it makes it a little bit more bearable. There's at least one bright spot, at least there's something to give thanks to God for. If you survey the Psalms, as we'll do in just a minute here, if, well, right now, if you want to turn to Psalm 9, you know, the Psalms span the whole of human emotion. In fact, as our Brother Dave mentioned on the table, one of the statements that Jesus made on the cross, uh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, or my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, um, is not a literal God has forsook Christ. But Jesus is trying to find the words to express his anguish on the cross. And what comes to mind? One of the Psalms. To sum up what he's going through. The Psalms, you'll find the highest of highs of jubilation. You'll find the lowest of lows. And there are some really challenging statements in the Psalms. Why am I saying all this? Because no matter what the Psalm is, you will find the Psalmist giving thanks in almost all things. Psalm cha- uh, the ninth Psalm, verses 1 and 2. Here, David is praising the justice of God, and yet he says, I will give thanks to Yahweh with all my heart. I will recount all your wondrous deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise in your name, O Most High. And yet he goes on to talk about his enemies and how he's praying for justice and he would be vindicated. And yet he, even in this situation, he is giving God thanks. Go to the 69th Psalm and you'll find a similar statement. In Psalm 69, we'll be looking there in verse uh, 30. Here is a Psalm of deliverance. David is being threatened. His enemies have surrounded him. And yet we read in the 30th verse of this psalm, he says, I will praise the name of God with song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. A couple more, Psalm 75 in verse 1. Here's a psalm of, uh, of Asaph, another one about God's judge, ju- judgment with equity. And he says here in verse 1, For your name is, or we give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks, for your name is near. Men recount your wondrous deeds. And Psalm 92, the first two verses. Psalm 92, verses 1 and 2. This psalm, we don't have the writer. I find it interesting. My Bible has the heading, A Song for the Sabbath Day. So a song of Old Testament worship. He writes, It is good to give thanks to Yahweh and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. He goes on to describe and extol the works of God. Whether you feel threatened or surrounded, you're in the valley or you're on the mountaintop and it's a day of worship or another work day, it's always an appropriate time to give credit to God for what he has done in your life. And this is, all, this is one of those teachings that isn't an old covenant, new covenant thing. It's carried through in the New Testament. You have 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57, which is a chapter about the resurrection of all things, and yet you find this statement the Apostle Paul makes in reference to that great doctrine. It says in chapter 15 and verse 57, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll find statements like that sprinkled throughout Paul's letters while he's in prison or traveling with companions, whether he's been betrayed by Demas or the beloved physician Luke is by his side. He finds things to be grateful for. And we have that again, that statement in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18. So how do we go about the giving of thanks? It seems pretty simple on the surface, and I would suggest to you it is, but there's some things we have to consider. 
First of all, we need to understand that thanksgiving is a choice, fundamentally. You, just like joy. You, to begin with, you have to choose to give thanks in all things. Again, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in every situation, for this is God's will for you. Um, in Philippians 4.8, for example, I think there's a principle here that apply to the situation. In Philippians 4 and the verses 8, Well, let's back up to verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say again, rejoice. Let your considerate spirit be known to all men, the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is dignified, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, consider these things. I think it's the New King James who says meditate upon these things. I think English Standard and some of the newer ones say think on these things. The idea is to set your mind on them. If you all went to uh, the Northside congregation's uh, Last week recently, you would have heard Brother Scott Taylor preach on this text in part, and he made a point that challenged me. He said, the reason why we do not reap the benefits of verse 7 is because we are not following verse 8. The reason why we have issues with, well, I've never felt this peace of God that it surpasses all comprehension. So it's probably it's in areas in our life, Philippians 4, 8 is not being applied properly. And that includes what we dwell on. You can choose to see the good, or you can see, choose to see the bad. Mr. Rogers um, tells a story, or told a story, when he was a boy. And think about the time he lived through. Um, He would have seen the first live television coverage of a a war. Uh, He saw calamities on TV, and he would ask. At one time, he told his mother. You know, he was just distraught, and this is—he's a child. He's distraught by what he's seen on television. Know what his mother said? Look for the people running in to the mess. The people who are choosing to go help. Now, you, we can see calamity. You turn on the evening news. Uh, channel 11 is at 9, channel 13 is at 10. Take your pick. And you'll see, you'll see heartbreaking stories. And you could choose to dwell on the negative, or you could choose to dwell on the positive of them. Well, well, that's positive about heartbreak. Look at the people who are trying to help. And I would suggest to you the same principles true in our lives. You can dwell on the stained carpet that's all matted. Believe me, you can. There's a lot to dwell on there. Or you can dwell on the fact that you have a roof over your head, you have a bed to sleep in, you have the, the little things we think as little, clean drinking water. Or the fact you have running water. I think of my great-grandmother who grew up in New Mexico in a one-room shack with no floor. It was dirt. And she was not being exaggerating when she said that. She lived in object poverty as a child. And I don't think in my whole time ever, I knew her, I don't think I ever, can, I can't remember her saying one negative complaining thing. And I asked my mom recently, she can't remember. And she had a lot longer years around her than I did. She saw it as every day it was a gift. Everything that she had was a gift. The family, the friends, whatever material possession she had, it was all a gift, which is that second point of thanksgiving. We need to remind ourselves where all good things come from. James reminds us that of James chapter 1 and verse 17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. 
coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. And what uh, James means here at the end of verse 17 is God is not duplicitous. He's not talking about both sides of his mouth. He's not going to give you something just in order to use it against you later or to hold it over you. If he gives good gifts, he's given good gifts. No strings attached. Everything good and holy and right in our lives comes from him. And brethren, I, that, that's, that's a lesson I've had to learn over and over and over and over and over and over again. Because if you're like me, you probably might fall into the trap of thinking it all depends upon you. You might have a tendency to focus only on the negative of what could go wrong or might go wrong. Or focusing so much on the next thing that you don't see the good things in your life in the moment. You know, there's a sitcom I enjoy watching. I'll leave the name out. But in the final episode, uh, Ed Helm, Helms is one of the actors in it. His character, it's a, one of those mockumentary shows, and they're interviewing me, and it's the, it's the last episode. And his character's going off to a different job. And he says, you know, I kind of wish you could know you were living through the good old days before they ended. And it's kind of that idea of we, we sometimes we get so busy of focusing on the next thing, we, we don't realize the times we're living in are, are really good. If you have family you love, you have friends you can count on, you have food on your table, you have brethren you can rely upon, you got it good. We got it good. And that's something to be thankful for. And to recognize it's God who has given that. The next point of, of how of Thanksgiving is to have specific prayers about Thanksgiving. I, I, I think oftentimes when we th- think about giving thanks, stop me if you've heard this one before. Lord, please bless this food to nourishment our bodies. Amen. That, that, uh, some of you are smirking, right? Which honestly, sometimes at our potlucks, it, it, it should be, Lord, please protect our bodies from this food. Um, it just, it, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> but maybe we need to pray a little bit differently when we give thanks. And maybe it shouldn't only be at supper, lunch, and breakfast. There's something we're thankful for. Here, in general, it's bad to be impulsive. That's what gets me in trouble with my waistline. Um, but there are some areas that are really good to be impulsive. Daniel Somner, who was a preacher of the 1800s, when he first came to faith, he resolved that at every impulse to do good, he would act upon it. And so what that meant, he was walking to the, it was a different time. Here he is at 13 years old walking to the, the, to the lumber mill to go work to support his mom. Um, anyway, and he's on his way to work, and he feels the impulse to go pray and give God thanks. And so what does he do? He goes off his path, finds a spot, takes a knee, and he prays. He might have done that two or three times trying to get to work, but he, that was his determination. And whenever he felt the impulse to do good, to praise God, to pray to him, he was going to act upon it. And maybe that's one area where we do need some impulsivity. You feel that knee-jerk reaction to thank God for something, do so. Something comes to your mind in the prayer to thank God for, do so. You're very grateful to see a certain brother or sister back assembling with us again, and you have opening prayer, pray so. But it's only going to strengthen this muscle of thanksgiving, which, back to Philippians 4 and verse 6, I know we read these verses just a moment ago, but if you look in Philippians 4 and verse 6, here again, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. So we think of petition, right? You're coming to somebody to appeal to them. Maybe very persistently. Maybe very naggingly. Now, there's petitions all the time. We're getting ready to come up in election season. Every time I'm going to walk out of Bookman's, there's going to be petitioners there for me to sign something, right? 
And sometimes, yeah, we, we petition God like that. He's told us to. But I find it interesting, that word with. It's like the word and. It couples things together. With our petitions, we are supposed to offer them with thanks. I'm supposed to thank God for in a petition. I think at a most basic level, one, you can even talk to God about your petitions. But two, you can thank God for who he is. Uh, we, we sing a hymn, and I thank Morgan for leading it, uh, in the worship tonight, leading up to this. Um, I forgot the actual line of what hymn it was, but it was how the Lord takes us back when we falter to that effect. The fact that our Lord, our God, does not have a limit like some of us do. We get to a point where we say, that, that's enough, we're done. And yes, God has that point at the end of time, and yes, that, that day of judgment has been fixed, but guess what? That, the principles of the, when Peter came to Jesus and said, how often shall I forgive my brother seven times? Peter was probably thinking he's pretty smart there. Jesus goes, "Uh uh-uh, I tell you seven times 70. Peter's like, whoa, that's a lot of times. And and Jesus will not say, well, you should only forgive your brother a hundred and something odd times or whatever that number is. Look, I I don't do math. You know that. He's not setting an actual limit. He's illustrating a point. doesn't matter if your brother comes to you a thousand times in one day. If he is earnestly repenting, you forgive. And God is infinitely more so like that. The fact that our God is so good and so kind and faithful and loving and just and how he hears our prayers and he answers them, those are all things to be thanking God for in our petitions. Also in Hebrews chapter 12, the final point here in the lesson will be yours. The fourth thing of the how of Thanksgiving is Thanksgiving is seen. Hebrews 12 and verse 28. Speaking of the church and the kingdom here, he says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, shaken, let us show gratitude, by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Chris Emerson, uh, he preaches in Texas, has a podcast called Excel Still More. I remember one particular episode I listened to. It was called Level 3 Gratitude. And I think this, this concept of thanksgiving is, is in here as Level 3 Gratitude, as he calls it. Um, the reason it's called Level 3 is we, we tend to normally think of thanksgiving, yes, we're thankful for things. We might feel thankful, and Level 2 might be actually telling God we're thankful. Level 3 is how can I pay gratitude forward, if you will, or how can I show my gratefulness? So here's what it looks like. Say I'm really thankful for a really close friend. I feel that level, I feel that gratitude for them. Let's pick on Dave Richards. Say I'm really thankful for Dave, and I am. I might offer, I I, I thank God for Dave in my prayers. Level three would be, I want to show Dave my gratitude by, I want to take him out to lunch this week, and the tab's on me. I'm not actually offering that. (laughs) Kurt's not here. Kurt cuts the check, so he knows what, no, anyway. That's what it looks like, is I feel thankful about something. I, I say thankful. I think about how I can show that gratitude. For your spouse. You know, I saw this funny image one time. It was a floral shop, and it showed the bouquet sizes, and they got bigger. And underneath it said, how bad did you mess up? Yeah, we laugh at that. That shouldn't be the case. I know this is, maybe this is the smartest unmarried advice I'm ever going to give. If you're getting your spouse flowers only when you mess up, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. Showing gratitude is recognizing, you know, you see something in the store and you know your spouse likes it. Maybe it's two or three bucks. Okay, let me get that. You recognize it's been a long day. Hey, let, let's, let's not worry 
about dinner tonight. We'll do something else. We can show gratitude in many different ways to friends, families, to people in our lives, picking up coffee for somebody, helping with a load, whatever it is, but showing that gratitude. And the funny thing is, and this is not the reason why we should be doing this, but all the science and the research is showing now, if you want to live a joyful, thankful life, you just start acting joyful and thankful. It feeds into itself. And when you feel those moments where you're, you don't really want to be thankful, you really don't want to be grateful, those are the times where, as we said in that first principle, you got, you got to choose to be grateful. You got to choose to be thankful. Clearly, it's a biblical concept, and if we want to practice Thanksgiving, we need to have, it, it's a choice. We need to remind ourselves where all the good things come from in our lives. Not be afraid to offer specific thanks to God for that, and be willing to show gratitude in our own lives. As we're going into our secular American holiday of Thanksgiving this week, it's, these are good things to think about. Maybe we can think of people in our lives we can bless this week or this year in this season that we're going into, that we can show them how grateful we are for them. And one of the things we can always be thankful for, no matter what day, no matter how good or bad the day is, is the fact that Christ did come to save sinners. You know, we don't ever want to close an hour of worship without offering the Lord's invitation. And I invite you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Um, in Acts chapter 2, you have the gospel there uh, is preached for the first time on the day of Pentecost. And the, the question of the hour is, what are we going to do about our sins? We recognize we've killed Christ. We've recognized that he was, he was what you were saying to us, Peter. He was the Lord of Joel 2. That's what it says in verse 14 through 21. And when they asked him, when, when Peter's done preaching that sermon, that this Lord is Jesus who you killed, he said, what are we going to do about it? And Peter said this in verse 38. Repent. And each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise for you and your children, for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he saw me bore witness and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this, ch- uh, this crooked generation. So then those who received his word were baptized. And that day were added about 3,000 souls. Maybe you've never done that. That's not my idea. That's not our particular congregation's idea. That's what the book says for salvation. And we can assist you with that tonight. There is water ready, but maybe you've done that in the past and you're struggling. You need encouragement. You need prayers. Maybe you have a need in your life. We would love to help. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, won't you meet me down here at the front as Sarah stands and sing the song that's been selected?